welcome to this short video brought to you by Mayor Brown. Today, we're talking about rare earth elements, a discrete series of metals without which much of the complex, high-tech modern world would and could not exist. The extent to which these ores that contain these metals are economically extractable, the jurisdictions of the reserves concerned, and the global politics associated with these commodities makes them truly a game-changing issue. We're joined today by Ian Coles, a man described by Chambers as the UK's leading mining lawyer and the lead partner of Mayor Brown's mining practice. Thank you for joining us, Ian. Thank you, Ben. Good morning. Morning. Before we talk about the legal issues, which make rare earth interesting, quickly tell our viewers about what makes these elements so special. Uh, well, it's uh, quite astonishing, as you referred to in your introduction, how essential they have become to uh, our uh, economy today. Uh, things such as uh, wind farms, uh, the rotors really require rare earths, your telephone, your screens, everything that we have come to associate with 21st century technology requires rare earths. Rare earths are a discrete group of 17 elements, but they are in fact not that rare at all. They're just difficult to find in concentrations which might make them exploitable. Ian, what sort of controls and pressures can one place on governments when changing their export regimes? And where does that leave the investor? Well, Ben, that's a very interesting question uh, because uh, there is actually not much uh, World Trade Organization uh, considerations apart that can be done if a government just decides that it is going to restrict the export of a particular mineral. But particularly in the context of rare earths, it does lead to um, the observation that uh, supply side constraints are incredibly uh, difficult to overcome because it takes so long to develop an alternative project. Um, common wisdom is that for a rare earth project it probably takes between five and seven years uh, from discovering the deposit to bring it on stream. So uh, there's no quick fix uh, to the question that you, you, you put and in fact it, it, it is pro probably the biggest issue in relation to rare earths right now. It is security of supply. Okay, and I understand that some uh, downstream users of the metals are actually uh, supply chain shortening. Uh, right. The likes of Toyota investing uh, beyond their original supplier and actually entering the mining space. Uh, very much so. We actually have some personal experience in connection with that. We've been, uh, amongst other things, recently assisting the government of Afghanistan in relation to the development of the mining industry there. And potentially there are rare, rare earths in Afghanistan <clears throat> and we, we know that there is direct interest from the motor industry uh, in connection with that so that they can go straight from, straight from mine into, into auto. Um, but of course it requires a significant amount of investment uh, which is why supply chain shortening is not as straightforward as it might seem. And this just geopolitical risk for want to describe it, um, that's also presumably driving um, policy. Right. Um, in America, it's led to legislation requiring stockpiling uh, of rare earths. And there have been some attempts to suggest that actually America should uh, move its industry away from reliance on rare earths. Um, but that kind of seismic shift takes time. You can't suddenly decide you're going to build a car a different way. And it's, it's really very interesting in the case of rare earths because they're so, they're, they're, their use is so frequent yet the supply is so, it's a relatively small industry. I think Ernst & Young estimated that by 2015, the size of the industry will be between five and six billion. It is not that big. In relation uh, to the cost of a mine, with right. the actual initial investment, you're saying it's, did you say, five to seven years to bring one online? Right, and the big, uh, big rare earth mine, it could cost a billion to two billion to develop it. So the economics just don't work in many, in many respects. Oh, so given China's, um trade constraints and the fact that they're producing, uh, we believe, around 90% of the world's rare earths currently. And um, well, there's been news out of Japan that they're, they've, they've got um, very high concentrations of, of rare earths in their, in their sh sea shelves, but it will be deep ocean mining. Right, and Japan um, consumes something like 60% of the world's rare earths. So they've got a a great interest in seeing whether or not a alternative supply can be uh, generated given the historical uh, political issues between China and Japan. And you're right, people have been talking about the seabed as, a, as an alternative, 
but nobody should underestimate the technological challenge of trying to mine on the seabed. Uh, you're talking about mining 10,000 feet down uh, with all the pressure issues, the source technological issues, and beyond diamond uh, offshore mining in South Africa and Namibia and other places, I don't think anybody's really cracked it yet. Uh, there's the Nautilus project in PNG, but that's now tied up in a political, uh, political issue. Uh, the Nautilus mine is, is scheduled to cost something like a billion dollars uh, to build the ship and the associated infrastructure. Put that in the context of what we just said, that the world market for rare earths is probably no more than five or six billion. Difficult to see how those economics work. You mentioned the Nautilus project in Papua New Guinea. Um, it allows you to reflect on how um, a country's politic can significantly affect mm. a mining investment. How does one deal with the political part of the approach? It's probably the biggest issue in the mining industry today, not just in rare earths, but in virtually every um, mining operation in every jurisdiction. The fact that countries use the mining industry um, as a way, well, for, for many countries, PNG, for example, not necessarily for China, the mining industry probably generates the greatest proportion of their GDP. Uh, and with the commodity super cycle, and this applies to rare earths, actually, uh, prices have gone up, generally speaking. Mm. And at that point in the cycle, many countries feel the need to uh, try and extract a little more. Um, so you've seen it happen, you've seen it happen all over the place actually. And it's not, it's not just emerging markets, you've seen it happen in Australia, Chile, Kenya, PNG, uh, many African jurisdictions. So when we talk about uh, deep ocean mining, um, what legal frameworks support deep seafloor mining? Well, the the law relating to deep sea mining uh, has been in formation for almost as long as I've been actually studying law and being a lawyer. Um, when, I was, when I was actually at university, I studied uh, the preparation for the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the primary legislation here, which actually ultimately came into effect in 1982. Uh, so far, that needs to be implemented pursuant to more detailed regulations. So far, keeping in mind that that is now 32 years ago, uh, they have got as far as regulations for exploration. There are no regulations for exploitation yet. They're expected to come into effect in, I think it's either 2015 or 2016. Having said that, there's been very little exploration. I think the International Seabed Authority, which is the authority which uh, administers the law and the regulations, has issued around about 13 or 14 licenses so far and there's been relatively little activity. So this is for the future. This is not the short-term solution to rare earth. Are you seeing any um, activity hotspots or particular jurisdictions in which they're investing heavily? Well, the ones that people are talking about at the moment are potentially Mongolia, uh, which has the same geological trend as uh, where the rare earths are supplied in China right now in Inner Mongolia. Um, but that's probably going to be a slow burn. Uh, development of projects in Mongolia has been relatively slow. Kazakhstan, uh, there is um, a lot of rare earth deposits there, and the Japanese in particular, I believe, are very interested in uh, assisting in connection with that. And Greenland, uh, possibly one of the more interesting ones, just given the nature of the country. Uh, in fact, there are only 50,000 people there. Um, they've relatively recently changed government uh, government is, uh, looks as though it's going to be uh, more friendly towards the mining industry. Historically, uh, particularly on environmental grounds, um, there has not been that much development, but earlier this year there was a sort of block on uranium mining which was, which was taken off. So Greenland could really become a major producer of, of rare earth. Clearly rare earth mining creates, at the processing stage at least, um, a unique set of issues associated with its byproducts. You, 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 you talked about uh, radioactive elements. There's that issue. There's the, um, the toxins in the tailings. Um, are these environmental considerations unique to rare earths, or is it just the scale? It's not unique to rare earths. Um, 
most mining activity is messy. Uh, it either involves <coughs> extraction of a messy mineral like coal, or it involves a messy chemical treatment like leaching. Rare earth is particularly thrown into focus because of the huge amount of processing you need to extract the rare earth from the ore. And for years, that's actually been a barrier to rare earth production uh, because it is so expensive for the amount of uh, end product which is produced. And as you say, um, the byproducts of the chemical process to extract rare earths leaves a particularly messy, toxic sludge, including thorium, uh, which is potentially really nasty. Um, so environmental considerations are, are huge. And for a while, that's been a concern in connection with the development of the Mountain Pass project in the States, which potentially can produce enough rare earth for all of North America, uh, owned by Molycor. Uh, but environmental considerations in the States present a considerable break on the mining industry right now. Um, but it's the case virtually everywhere. I know people say that China is sort of less concerned about environmental issues, but that has certainly changed over the space of the past four or five years. I think one of their, one of their biggest projects has a, a tailings lake of something like 11 square kilometers, which is seven Hyde Parks. Uh, so, you know, the scale of it is quite, quite monumental. And the cost, of course, of taking care of it is huge. In terms of the proportion of cost associated with the exploitation, one imagines the processing component and the environmental component is, is, is quite significant for rare earth particularly. Um, I noticed that the Linus Corporation um, has invested in a processing plant in Malaysia. Do you think this changes the global economics associated with uh, the, the extraction of rare earths? Yes, that's a quite an interesting phenomenon, Ben. Um, uh, it's called the Mount Well Project. Um, and the ore actually comes from Australia and is shipped uh, to Malaysia for processing. And the expectation is, is that that processing plant will be able to take ore from other projects as it's developed. And as the capital investment has largely been made, uh, that will all mean that the production from those other mines is sort of capable of being uh, produced efficiently or refined efficiently. Uh, so that may be one of the long-term solutions to the rare earth uh, conundrum. I understand that you're seeing an increased uh, volume or level of conversations um, about rare earth mining in the city from clients and that the firm has, as a result, produced a series of white papers. That's right. I mean, Mayor Brown is extremely active in the mining sector generally. Uh, we like to think we're at the forefront of uh, people's thinking, particularly with respect to legal issues and rare earths, as we discussed in this uh, video clip, uh, is in that in that space. So we have produced a series of papers uh, on a variety of issues, including uh, deep sea mining, including supply chain, uh, and they are available on our website, mayorbrown.com. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and thanks for your time. My pleasure.